spend much time here. The next question was on pathogenesis. So whenever you get a question on this, even for those who are appearing for the MCQs, this question has been asked multiple times. What is the pathology, pathophysiology behind a nocturnal anabresis? So you need to bring about the three levels, bladder, kidney, and brain. So there are problems at these. So when you talk to the examiner, try to explain him. Okay, so there is a problem at the level of the bladder. There is a problem at the level of the kidney and at the level of the brain. At the level of the bladder, the bladder, the functional capacity appears to be small and the bladder appears to be small functionally, not anatomically. The functionally, the bladder is small. It is not able to hold urine or, or there is a possibility of some theory suggesting of nocturnal dead pressure overactivity that doesn't allow the bladder to hold urine during sleep. So one is at the level of the bladder. Second is at the level of the kidney the antidiuretic hormone responsiveness decreases at the bedtime. So this is another theory which has been given. So there is a nocturnal polyuria where the patient is passing a lot of urine in the night. Uh, nocturnal polyuria for how is it defined? More than 20% of the total voided volume if the patient is voiding at uh, night then or this is for a young patient. And for elderly, if it is more than 33% of the total voided volume for elderly, then it is, uh, so this is the, how nocturnal polyuria is defined. Just coming back to the topic, brain, at the level of brain, you mentioned about this point, impaired sleep arousal mechanism. Normally, when the bladder is full, normally what happens when the bladder is full, it sends a signal to the brain that could get up, come on, get up, go, go to the washroom and void. But in these children, in some children, the sleep arousal mechanism is not present on in response to a distended bladder. And so the bladder passes urine in the bed. So this is the problem that happens at the uh, different levels. And be very clear when you are talking to the examiner. Be very clear when you're talking to the examiner. This will give a good impression. Management of this this is a very sensitive issue the parents usually get very uh, frustrated so uh, the examiner already told you that the, it has hampered the quality of life of the of the child as well as the parents so what happens the parents start punishing their child the scars holding their child so the first thing that you should bring in the behavioral treatment is the parents should never scold their child because this is going to there has been sufficient evidence to prove that when the parents scold their child this problem aggravates so please, uh, so you need to bring this point into your behavioral treatment as well. You mentioned about time to widening. Widening before bed. This is very simple. Try to bring it, uh, this point. Decrease fluid because the bladder diary, when the examiner gives you a bladder diary. So I did not give you a bladder diary. In your real exam, you will be given a bladder diary. And in the bladder diary, always go through the intake part. We have a tendency to just look at the output and if there is any leak and all. So this part, we have a tendency to look, but always look at the intake part. There will be two points, three points important in the intake part. Either the total volume will be more or there'll be a lot of coffee the patient is taking, a lot of tea the patient is taking. There will be a lot of important stuffs in the intake part of that chart. So go through it. And if the examiner is telling you that the patient is taking more fluid towards the night, so that is what the, uh, the solution is. Decrease the caffeine, decrease the fluid intake after the evening. Okay. So once you uh, advise the patient behavioral treatment, enuresis alarm is very important. Now, how does it work? See, the first principle is it works on the Pavlov's principle, like the Pavlov uh, experiment on conditioned reflex. Similar uh, mechanism is for an enuresis alarm. So what happens? The child is asleep. There is an alarm connected to his diaper. He passes urine. The alarm rings. He gets up. This is, he goes to, now this important thing that you have to tell the examiner that in this, even though the child is seven years, he has to take responsibility of this alarm. He has to get up. He has to go to the washroom, change his diaper and change his clothes and come back and again fix the alarm and go to sleep. Now, when he's doing it, again, if he uh, passes urine, the alarm is going to ring again, and again, he's going to get up and go. So this is how the condition reflex is starting, and his brain is going to develop a condition reflex that, okay, don't pass urine because you have to get up again and do all this stuff yourself. So this is the basic principle of a aneurysis alarm. So it works on the conditioned reflex principle, conditioned reflex 
principle. Okay, this is the keyword, and you can explain with an example that this is that that is how it works. The child uh, brain doesn't want to now uh, get up, doesn't want to pass urine because he has to. He has been conditioned that way that an alarm is going to ring and he has to get up to pass urine and change the clothes. So this is important. How does it work? And the how the no this is important. Now, why not a dex? Uh, why not a desmopressin? Just start the patient on desmopressin. Forget about this alarm. The mother is very happy with desmopressin, suppose, but not. This is not the scenario. So, if you compare the success rate, it might be same, but that is an only early success rate for a desmopressin treatment. The advantage of an alarm treatment is it conditions your brain, and so it is a sustained response. It is a long-term sustained response you are uh, what you are going to get result is going to persist for a long time okay the relapse rate is very less though the onset is very slow you might find the mother is very becoming irritated that the child is not getting response to the alarm but you need to counsel that this is going to take at least six weeks to come to the, uh, to start an onset uh, for the action and when do you say this is a successful alarm treatment 14 consecutive dry nights then you call it a successful alarm treatment. Success rate, you mentioned it correctly. Desmopressin, it acts as an agonist of the V2 receptors on the collecting duct. Okay, so it's uh, for those who are appearing for section one, V2 receptors, collecting duct, increases water reabsorption, decreases the urine output. Simple, simple, simple uh, mechanism. Dose is 0.2 milligram orally, though you might give 0.1, some might give uh, more in the practice, but it's always better to start with a 0.2 milligram, half-life two to three hours, and the relapse rate. That is what I was mentioning. You give the desmopressin, the child is dry. It has a good success rate, but the problem is high relapse rate. Okay, 60 to 70 percent is a relapse rate. And always, always, always you need to explain about weight gain. The mother is going to be worried that the child is becoming uh, obese, but that is not the scenario. The weight gain is because of the fluid uh, retention, okay? So because the desmopressin is causing more fluid reabsorption, the child is going to gain weight, but this is temporary, and you need to monitor the sodium. So regarding the weight gain, you need to counsel the mother. If you think that the bladder capacity is less, you need to you can add oxybutynin, 0.2 milligram per kg. So this is an anticholinergic. This was the last question. You said tricyclic antidepressant. We use tricyclic antidepressant because of the anticholinergic property itself. So it is not the first choice in a child. It's always better to use oxybutynin in a child. Okay, Dr. Ford, this is all about the nocturnal 